Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 58 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I am so glad that you're here today. Uh, today, I had the priv privilege and honor of speaking with Karen Dion, who wrote a smash bestseller. Uh, I can't even remember where I first heard about it. Um, uh, called The Marsh King's Daughter, which came out a couple months ago, and it is so good, y'all. The Marsh King's Daughter. Go get it. It's kind of like the room strikes back. It's so good and it's so dark and it's so compelling and it's pretty twisted. And um, the things that Karen does with language, I didn't mention this when I was talking to her, but the way she drops in a, a very small clue, the tiniest clue that is just so shocking. Uh, oh, she's just a genius at it. So um, I loved talking to her. She is so sweet and so smart and you're going to really enjoy it. A little update on what's been going around around here. I've been traveling again. Um, so this is a little bit late. Forgive the delay on the release of the podcast this week. Um, I went for a week to see the eclipse, the great eclipse of 2017. Uh, my wife has family in Casper, Wyoming. So we drove out there and it took two days to drive out there. Uh, two days to drive back and it was for a two and a half minute phenomenon and it was completely worth it. It really was. We were in the path of totality. Casper was said to be the best place in the nation to see it. We just happened to have family there. Um, but we spent a couple days there. I bought some really cute new cowboy boots, y'all. They are the cutest. Uh, so I have new red cowboy boots to replace my old broken down red cowboy boots, which I will probably never get rid of. Um, because I always think of the Wonder Boys. Did did you all read that wonderful book or see the movie? You know how the one writer gal um, wears her red cowboy boots? Yes, I always do feel a little bit like, I think it's Katie Holmes who plays that part uh, when I'm wearing those boots, but I love them. So got some new boots, saw the eclipse, which was intensely awesome and not predictable. And I think that everybody felt about it a little bit differently. Uh, but I think I was most struck by the chill, the sudden chill that really dropped into effect right about when the moon was maybe a quarter of the way eating into the sun and then it just got colder and colder and colder. And by colder, I mean it dropped down to 70 degrees. But when we had started watching, it was around 85 and people were getting out their sweaters and then it goes dark and um, that 360 degree sunset sunrise that was all around us. I will never forget. Um, I particularly liked the sounds that we heard as people in the neighborhood around us cheered and yelled and um, there were no screams of terror. However, it really did make it clear to me that, you know, if this had happened at almost any other point in human history, if you had just been outside, you know, farming your farm, moving your oxen from one pasture to the other, and you looked up and saw that, you would know that you would need to sacrifice some virgins immediately. The world was ending. Uh, that should not happen. It was such an unnatural, natural thing to occur. Um, and then the diamond coming out at the end, I know that I'm saying what everybody else has said, but it was really, truly a unique experience, and I'm so grateful that I got to go. But, of course, that means I was on the road and feeling frustrated by not having more time to work. Sorry, loud car outside. Um, so I made sure that while we were driving, I was working on um, plotting a bunch of stuff. I have finally gotten to the very end of the thriller and have worked out the very, very ending. So thank God. So um, writing that, that feels really good. Also working on a proposal, um, yet another proposal to send off to Random House Australia. So I'm playing with a bunch of ideas, um, trying to amalgamate a bunch of different obsessions because I really think that writing about obsession is awesome and key in terms of keeping your own interest in your own writing. So I'm enjoying this time of just diving deep into my obsessions and going down those rabbit holes on Wikipedia and YouTube um, and Reddit. I've actually been looking at some Reddit stories on the worst family secrets that are out there. Did you know there are a lot of them? You should look at the Reddit worst family secrets. There are some terrible ones. Um, it's awesome. So that's what I have been working on. I've been doing a, playing with a little bit of marketing on Amazon AMS, uh, trying to nail that a little bit more. Uh, 
Thank you guys so much for the wonderful response that I got about the Patreon essay that I gave you last week on MP3 format in the podcast. Uh, The one about being liars and thieves as writers, which we are. And uh, the emails and tweets that I have received from that have been truly moving and gracious. And I am so grateful for them and for you for listening. Uh, I'm even more grateful for the support you show me in terms of Patreon. Thank you so much. If you cannot do that, I completely understand. And those of you who can do and do support me on Patreon, um, I say a huge, honest, genuine thanks. Uh, I kind of, I kind of asked for some support last week, which made me feel uncomfortable and I did it anyway. And I just want to tell you some names of people who are supporting now and have rocked my world. Um, Mariah upped her pledge. Mariah, Mariah, Mariah. Love you. Um, Cheryl R. Hayes. Thank you. Juliet Kelly. Thank you. Jody Jolkowski Nelson. Thank you. Emberly Nesbitt. Thank you. Uh, Michael Younger. Thanks. 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 Katie. Thank you. And Laura. Thank you to all the new patrons and all to all the patrons who are supporting me at any level. A dollar seriously is awesome. Patreon.com backslash Rachel. But you know what? I pounded you over the head with it last week, so I'm not going to this week. We're going to jump right back into the interview with Karen Dion. Um, And I really can't tell you more. If you enjoy psychological thriller suspense, grab the book. Get on the list at the library. Go buy it at Amazon. From your local independent bookseller would be the best. Um, And enjoy it. It is so good. All right. Enjoy the interview. And I wish you very happy writing. Okay. Well, I could not be more pleased today to welcome Karen Dion to the show. Hi, Karen. Hi, Rachel. Yay. All right. Well, let me give a little introduction for those people who might not know you. Karen Dion is the author of the dark psychological suspense novel, The Marsh King's Daughter, and three other novels. She is co-founder of the online writers community Backspace, the organizer of the Salt Clay Writers Retreat. Is that? No, Salt Salt Key. Salt Key, yes. Right. I read it wrong. Salt Key Writers Retreat and a member of the International Thriller Writers where she served on the board of directors. She has been honored by the Michigan Humanities Council as a humanities scholar and lives with her husband in Detroit's northern suburbs. Karen, I emailed you, and so you already know this, but I finished The Marsh King's Daughter, I think last week or two weeks ago, and it blew my mind. Thank you for writing such an incredibly dark and riveting and no holds barred kind of book Um, well gosh thank you so much you know i mean it's it's so rewarding you know this when when a reader gets your book and understands what you were doing with it so thank you well there's just this there while i was reading um i i i I love psychological suspense i read a lot of it i'm trying to write one right now my first one and and I think maybe because I'm writing one for the first time, I'm finally really looking into the crafting of them. And what I loved about your book was that every time I thought you had pushed it as far as you could push something, you pushed it a little bit more. Uh-huh. <laughs> Is that something you come to naturally or? I, I think it comes from writing thrillers because, you know, every scene has to have a payoff. And, and you know, the premise or the, the core device that a thriller uses is it it gets worse and worse you know so whether it's whether it's one of those intimate family you know drama type thrillers or a save the world type thriller you know each each step of the story has to take the book in a darker place and it's and it's truly something i am incorporating right now so you have actually changed that part of my writing because i do normally write domestic drama but and everything gets does get worse, of course, as as all books do. But this one, I'm just pushing harder because of you. So thank you so much. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, let's talk about your process, as this that's what this show is all about. So I'd love to know what is the best time of day for you to write, and where do you get your writing done? I'm an early riser, so I get up every morning like about five a.m., which sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you naturally wake up that way, or set an alarm? I do. I yeah. do. And so you know, a cup of coffee check New York Times, check emails, check Facebook. Three hours later, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) I sit down to write. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and do you write at home or do you go out or? I'm very fortunate. Um, 
once Marsh King's Daughter sold, my life changed drastically mm. because um, prior to that, I was writing in one of the smallest bedrooms in our house. So it was a tiny, cramped area, maybe nine by ten was the size of my office. Yeah. And you know, if I if I didn't shut my door, there was the noises of people walking around me and so forth. Pretty much what every other writer does, <laughs> right? You know. But after the novel sold, um. I, I should say, my husband and I were doing furniture upholstery in a workshop, uh, a separate building on our property. Oh, neat. So the Marsh King's daughter sold so well, my husband was able to retire. Fantastic. <laughs> and, so, and so we remodeled the back half of the workshop. So now my office space is like 20 by 25. I have a desk area, a lounging area. Oh. I have patio doors that open out the back to a private garden. I mean, it is so nice. <laughs> that is so dreamy. That's why it I really asked. It really is thing. lovely. Wow. And because it's separate from the house, you know, I can come in when I'm ready to take a break and not be interrupted. So it's really, I, I'm very spoiled right now. Do you have to deal with the noise of the shop that you're attached to now though like uh, is no, your husband out there doing not, things it's not working there anymore it's but perfect we, i know <laughs> well you know we are in detroit's northern suburbs so yeah. you know there are noises around me and and when the, the lawn crew does the yard behind me with the leaf blower i have to shut the door but you know these are not major problems. <laughs> that's so awesome are you in there right now i am oh and that looks beautiful awesome thank you thank you how do you celebrate finishing a project well, I celebrate like all the little stages along yeah. the way. So, you know, if I write a scene, I I have a little mini celebration. Usually involves food, very sadly, but so <laughs> yeah, but finishing a project, I like to splurge on like a nice bottle of whiskey and just oh. kind of kick back and You're my kind of girl. I <laughs> I'm I'm known when a book comes out, I buy a bottle of Laphroaig scotch. Ah. Um, and huh. I, I make That's it last hard. as long as possible, but it's, it's hard to yeah. justify those purchases. But yeah, <laughs> I know. We have, well, you know, writing a book is such a huge project, yeah. as you know. And yeah. so I think it deserves a little celebration well, when you're done. I agree. How much time do you take off between projects? Well, for this, this, I took a two book deal when oh, the March uh -huh. daughter sold. So no time off at all, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. I had to just fold right into the next book, but um, I'm, expecting to finish book two around December. So I'm going to take a week off. Um, my daughter and I, well, you mentioned the Salt Key Writers Retreat. Yeah. So um, my youngest daughter always came as my assistant. Oh. And so we're, we're both going to go down for like a week in January. I, I oh. better be done by January, but you know, that's going to be my big reward. Like I say, my life has changed since the Marsh King's daughter. I am so pleased to hear that. I Thank you. love that. How many kids do you have? I have four children, but yeah. they're all grown. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how nice. Okay. Uh, what is the absolute best or worst writing advice you've ever been given? Um, you know, the best writing advice is something that I got just very recently from Karen Slaughter. Um, oh, yeah, she's she, great. Yeah, she's fantastic. And she had noted that, you know, I was doing a lot of touring this summer for the Marsh King's Daughter. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote to me, rest up. And the write the write the next book, <laughs> and I thought you know that really encapsulates it all because the rest up part well we have to be in a good frame of mind when we're writing you know mm -hmm. um, we obviously we don't all have ideal writing circumstances but you have to be in the zone so you know that was the rest up part and then of course write the next book you know <laughs> yeah that's how it works <laughs> literally the best advice ever F mm -hmm. fantastic can you share a craft tip? of any sort? Um, I would like to share something I learned from writing The Marsh King's Daughter. Oh, yes, and please. that was to not be afraid to stretch and grow and try something new. For instance, um, when I started writing The Marsh King's Daughter, it was the first time I had ever written where the character directly addresses the reader, mm -hmm. you know, and so that was new to me. Um, also new to me was the dual storyline. I hadn't done that before. And I use present tense for the story that takes place in the present and past tense, first person both, past tense for the story that takes place in the past. Again, I hadn't done that. And as you know, the book has like a lot of flashbacks. A lot. You're constantly going. Well, and that's what I really 
that's what I re- I, one of the things I really loved about the book is that you managed to have those dual timelines and leave each one at a cliffhanger every time. So every time we'd leave the current day and go back into the past, I'd be a little bit annoyed. And then again, like in the good annoyed, like, oh, God, I got to know. So. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so, you know, cumulatively, all those were things that I had never tried before, but mm-hmm. the story required it. And um, so... I think that would be my best tip is is to experiment while you're writing. Don't just do the tried and true, but you know, um, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. I love that. Did you do you tend to be more of a plotter or a pantser? Um, mostly plotter. Yeah. So but, did did you know with Marsh King's Daughter how it would all unfold, or did you have to no, work your way there? See, Marsh King's Daughter was different. My previous novels were science-based thrillers similar Mm -hmm. to what Michael Crichton writes. Mm -hmm. And I started with plot for those books Mm -hmm. and then created characters to support the plot. Um, Hopefully interesting and engaging characters, but I still started with with the plot. So the Marsh King's Daughter, um, I actually woke up in the middle of the night with the first sentences of the novel in my head. (laughs) I always hear about that happening and it has not happened to me. I know. They were fully formed. You know, I wasn't the dreaming, dreaming the character and, and the sentences, you know, if I told you my mother's name, you'd recognize it right away. My mother was famous, though she never wanted to be. Ugh. Hers was the kind of fame anyone would wish for. J.C. Dugard, Amanda Berry, Elizabeth Smart, that kind of fame, though my mother was none of them. It was just there. Boom. You know, and, so, you know, <laughs> so the next morning. Um, I wrote up a few paragraphs in the character's voice, which was basically her telling me who she was. Mm-hmm. And that's the first page of the novel, which I think is so cool. Wow. Yeah. I know. That never and, happens. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I've been sleeping a lot, <laughs> waiting for it to happen again. And it's not. Sure. Yeah. So so I had the character. And, and then as I wrote up those paragraphs, I set it in, uh, gave the setting where she grew up in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by swamp in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And that's an area that I know well, which is like a whole other story. So I had the setting, character in the setting, but I needed a story. And so I took my childhood fairy tale books off the shelf because I love books that tell, offer like a modern take on fairy tales, like Eowyn Ivy's The Snow Child. And so I started paging through, and that's when I found the fairy tale, The Marsh King's Daughter. And, you know, the fit, as you know, is so perfect. It's perfect. I used that then to structure the story. So you could say that was, that was pantsing, definitely. definitely. But then once I got to that point, um, and the story grew too big to hold it all in my head, then I outlined it. Oh, that is so cool. That is so cool. I and I had forgotten was... about how I'd, I'd, I'd read all those stories as a kid and I'd forgotten how gruesome they yeah. really are. And I don't, I don't, I don't ever remember reading The Marsh King's Daughter. So, um, but I must have, but. Right. And see, I must have too. So, I mean, it was there. It was in, in your heart, consciousness. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you have self doubt or those dark days, how do you deal with it? You know, um, I'm sitting here smiling, telling you how great everything is. But honestly, at heart, every day is a dark day. Oh, I love, you know? I love hearing that. <laughs> yeah. I struggle constantly, you know, with the whole, is this good enough? You know, even like story, the story I'm working on, the new book. Yes, my editor has approved it. Yes, he's excited about it. But I'm constantly, oh, but is it going to be good enough? You know, yeah. is it going to be a worthy follow-up to the Marsh King's daughter. And, you know, all those anxieties are always there. But it even comes down to, like, a scene level and a sentence level. You know, you're always doubting, is this the best way to say this, you know? And um, so I'm kind of obsessive that way. I will say probably the best, the the only day I didn't have any self-doubt was the day the New York Times review came out. (laughs) That was a very good day. I didn't actually ever see the review. It was it was positive, oh, obviously. It was astonishing. You know, I I knew that it was my book was going to be reviewed in the New York Times, which that's fantastic, Huge. right? I can't imagine. And I was I was expecting a little mention it, as part it it was going to be part of a thriller roundup. So I uh-huh. was expecting a little mention at the bottom, maybe a word or two that we could use as a pull quote, right. you know, exciting or something right. like that. Well, it was featured at the top, maybe like twice as long as the others. The reviewers called the book subtle, brilliant, and mature, <gasps> about as good as a thriller can be. There wasn't there wasn't an off note in it 
in the review at all. It oh, was just so cool. astonishing. Yeah. Oh, so that was so cool. a good day. <laughs> so you have to like ride that for the for the hard days. But I am very glad you said that because I'm deep in the, the deep in the darkest pit of of finishing this novel, and I know that mm-hmm. everything is just terrible as it always is, and I'll fix it yes. all. But it's just so so hard. It is. And, and there's always that darkest before the dawn. We know this, you know, and, and maybe you've had this experience. I've gone back and I, I do read my novels mm-hmm. after they're published. And, you know, you recognize those parts that you especially struggled with and they seem fine and they're so smooth. And you think, why was this so hard when I was working on it? And but, you can't um, tell the difference. You can't. I, yep. I, I always tell my students that, that that later you will not be able to tell the days that you struggled from the days that you felt like you were dreaming the words onto the page. They all read the same. Your voice is your voice is your voice. So, but when That's we're really in the true. chair, when we're in the chair, yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't hold up. Um, on on really bad days, if you could never write again, um, what profession would you choose? Yeah, I had to think about that a little <laughs> bit, but I I think um, because I love the Caribbean so much, mm-hmm. I would probably be a uh, like a snorkeler instructor. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you snorkel? No. <laughs> I would have a little learning to do first. <laughs> I think maybe you but should. But I want to. You asked what would I want to do. Yeah. Oh, no. What would you want to do? Is da- I've had answers like um, Beyonce's backup dancers, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, that works. Yes. Um, but I think you should put snorkeling on your bucket list, though. Yeah, I think I should, too. On that week in a vacation, yes. I'll have to learn, right? Where Where yeah. is Salt Key? It's in the Bahamas. Uh, Bahamas, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I suddenly blanked out. So it's not at all far from Nassau. Okay. And when we had the um, retreat there, we would um, stay on Paradise Island, not far from the Atlantis Resort, and then you take a ferry over to Salt Key because there's no overnight accommodations there. Oh. But it has a lagoon, and it's just so beautiful. And it sounds uh, wonderful. I, yeah, so snorkeling. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to learn. Good, good, you, good. You inspire me. I, I love snorkeling, and it's very easy. And, and yeah, I, uh-huh. I highly recommend it. Um, what is the best book that you've read recently, and why did you love it? One of the books that I was really blown away by recently isn't out yet. It's going to publish in March, but, uh-huh. you know, I got to read an advanced copy. It's called The Hunger, okay. and it's by Alma Katsu, K-H-S-U. Okay. And it's about, it's a fictional I, uh, fictionalization of what happened with the Donner Party out west. Oh, neat. I just drove Donner Pass yesterday, so. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking a lot about them. <laughs> Well, you know, it was it, the story is so rich. It's it's like historical fiction, but beyond that, you know, mm-hmm. the characters are so real, and you know that of course she used the real people because mm-hmm. it's documented. But she created, you know, fictional lives for all of them, and you, it's one of those books where I was maybe ten pages in, and I knew I was going to read this whole thing. You know, just I devour it. it. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Good job. Yeah. And what's also fun is, is I've known Alma for a lot of years. You know, I think we met in 2006 at a Thriller Writers Conference Uh in Phoenix. And so last year at the Thriller Writers Conference in New York, um, she, her book is coming out with um, Putnam as it did mine. So, you know, we're sitting together at Putnam's table at the awards. Isn't that awesome? It it was so fun. It's so fun to see that. It's fun to see the people that we started with move to the same places and you know my life's goals are always to be able to go to the publisher parties with my best friends you know so yeah. so a couple of us are always talking about well, if you can get with penguin then we'll be able to go to this you know? yes i have crashed the publisher party on occasion i never have i always want to crash the harlequin one but uh, um yeah but I, i've heard that they're very not tolerant of that <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I would usually my question is what would you like to plug right now? But I am doing the hard plug for you on everyone should go out and buy the Marsh King's Daughter. Uh, but where can we find you online? My website is karendion.net. So okay. what word karendion.net. And are you on Twitter, or Facebook? I am Twitter, yeah. Facebook. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I put just put a fun post on Facebook today because I found that um, a makeup artist in Norway did a look with like a double row of tattoos across under her cheeks. It's the coolest thing ever. And for, for people that don't know, that's what my character in, yes. in the story has. So like a makeup look inspired by my novel. <laughs> that just gave so me cool. goosebumps. That is I know. so cool. You could be starting a new trend, worldwide trend. Yeah, you know, who knows? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, this um, this show will go live soon because I'm far behind, so it'll be up either today or tomorrow, so your post will still be there for people to look at. And what a treat yeah, it has be- been to talk to you, Karen. Thank oh, you I love talking so to you much. too, Rachel. And I, Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I can't wait to read your next book. So, Thank you. Yay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.